I'm James Turner. I'm the, the chief executive of the trust. Um, the first webinar we ran um, about a fortnight ago was on our new digital platform, Sutton Trust Online. Um, and for those of you who missed it, that's, I think, available on YouTube. So you're very welcome um, to tune in and look at that. Um, but this seminar, the one we're running at lunchtime today, is about um, our evaluation journey. And we particularly want to, to go through what we've learned over the last few years as we've been work, um, running our programs and evaluating their impact. But we also want to give you a bit of a sneak peek, a preview of a new section of our website, which brings together in one place all the research and analysis we've done over the last decade or so into something that's a bit more accessible and a bit more navigable than it was on our previous website. Um, so what I'm going to do is give a little bit of background um, to our work and then I'll hand over to Laura, our Director of Programs, who's going to get into some of the detail and actually give you a, a preview of the, of the Impact Hub as well. Um, as always with these things, you know, we're not pretending um, we have all the answers. Um, you know, particularly in a space that is as complex as evaluation and, the, uh, and collecting impact data. It's a very complex space, but we are really keen just to share with you uh, what we've learned, what we know, uh, and what some of our next steps are going to be. Uh, and in that vein, at the end, there should be a good five or ten minutes for some Q&As um, so that we can answer some of your questions. And if we run out of time, um, and in fact, anyway, we're really keen to keep the conversation going with you all offline as well, because this is very much the, you know, the start of what we're hoping to do next in evaluation. Um, so before we go into that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we're going to be recording the session because there are some people who wanted to be here who can't, so we're going to record it so they can see it later on. Um, if you have a question, please could you submit it for that final section um, through the Q&A bot uh, button, which I believe is at the, the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, um, please could you use the chat button uh, to alert us and we'll do our best to help. I'll be of no use whatsoever, but happily there are people on hand who will be, um, but hopefully everything will run um, smoothly. Um, so Laura, if you don't mind just circling onto the next slide, I just thought it'd be helpful as a first thing to set the macro picture and to remind us all why we're here, I guess, but also why finding out what genuinely works for the young people we're interested in is so important. So obviously the backdrop um, to all of our work um, is the social mobility picture in the UK. Um, and by social mobility, um, I mean, we mean at the Trust, you know, the extent to which a young person's future is determined by their background, as opposed to their talents, their aspirations, their achievements. Now, there's a lot of debate uh, among ac academics about the state of social mobility in this country, um, the trends, the classifications, whether it's best to look at class mobility, income mobility. But our reading of the literature, I think, um, finds that there's a consensus on three relatively depressing points. So first of all, um, social mobility in this country is lower than we would like. Um, so the relationship between what a child does and their parents' wealth and class is stronger than we would hope if we're interested in equal opportunities. Um, secondly, I think there's a consensus among many that over the last few decades, social mobility has either declined or it has flatlined, but it certainly um, isn't improving. So there is more to be done. Um, and then I think the third thing we know is if you look at the international comparisons of social mobility, the sort of rankings of social mobility. Um, in this country, we're almost always in the bottom half of developed nations, and some rankings put us right at the bottom, perhaps just alongside the United States, in terms of how closely linked a child's future is to their parents' background. Now, you know, we think, and I'm sure of you think, uh, this matters, because not only is it unfair uh, to an individual, um, but it also has a, a social and economic cost. Um, so it's a waste of talent, it's a waste of potential, and those are quantifiable costs. They're, these are quantifiable costs in terms of GDP, in terms of our competitors with other nations, which are better at using that pipeline of talent. So Laura, if you just go on to the, the next slide, please. Now, of course, this has been an exceptional year for everybody at every level, but I think it's been particularly exceptional for young people who are in education. 
Um, so all the disruption we've had over the last six months, I think, has lent um, weight to a consensus that the prognosis for social mobility um, is only going to get worse as a result of COVID and school closures. Um, so as many of you, you will know, you know, we at the Sutton Trust and many other research organisations have done lots of work which has shown that school closures, which has shown that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on the poorest people. So those young people who were already behind. Um, so if you look at the attainment gap, um, we know that uh, poorer pupils have struggled most with online learning. They're more likely to have been in schools which weren't as geared up uh, to teaching online as the more privileged schools. Um, we know young people have struggled with internet access, with access to devices, um, their parents haven't been as confident in homeschooling them as their, as their wealthier peers. So the net effect of this is that it's impacted those from poorer homes the most. And if you look at the research that our sister charity, the Education Endowment Foundation, put together, there was some signs over the last 10 years that that attainment gap in a very marginal way was narrowing. Uh, but the EF suggests that all that work might have been undone by what's happened over the last few months, which is, of course, very worrying for the social mobility trajectory of those of those pupils. We're also picking up through our research, through our surveys, through our contact with alumni and programme participants, that there's a great deal of uncertainty out there as well in terms of future prospects. So that might be uncertainty about what's going to be next for those young people in terms of universities, in terms of apprenticeships. Um, and of course, we know that that affects working class students the most. Working class students can't draw on the financial resources. They don't necessarily have the cultural capital, the social capital to deal with that uncertainty and weather the storm. And that's something that's coming across really clearly when we speak to young people in our target group. And this isn't an issue that is just going to affect sort of uh, 2020 and 2021. This is going to be something that washes through the system um, for decades to come. So we can look back at what happened in the 2008-2009 um, uh, downturn and we can see the implications for that on graduate employment um, and that you know they're depressing. Um, and we have also tried at the Trust to quantify what the impact of school closures has been in terms of lifetime earnings. And some research we released a couple of weeks ago put that figure at something like 11 billion pounds for, for young people who are in secondary school. And what we've also found is that that downturn in earnings is particularly going to affect the poorest students and the chances for social mobility going down, again, particularly affect the poorest students. Um, so again, a situation that was already far from promising in terms of social mobility is likely, unfortunately, only going to get worse um, over the next few years. So, Lord, do you mind going on to the, the next slide? Um, now, of course, we, all of you, you know, joining this seminar, all the people we work with in universities and other not-for-profits and corporates, you know, we want to do something about this. So you know, this idea that's at the top of that slide that every young person, no matter who their parents are, what school they go to or where, where they live, has, should have the chance to succeed in life is at the heart of everything we do. That doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to go on to the most elite universes. It doesn't mean necessarily that everyone has to go on to really high, highly paid careers. But it is about informed choices and making sure those choices are equally available to all young people and no avenue is closed. And the way we do that, as many of you will know, is through this, this dual approach. So on the one hand, on the left of that slide, you see we work with about 5,000 young people every year. It was actually more like 7,000 this year because we ramped up our, our provision. And that's about transforming individual lives. So we work with mostly students in secondary school, mostly students who are age 16 plus, um, and we work with them to um, help them get into top universities and top professions. Um, but the other side of our work, which again many of you will know, is about driving systematic change. So that's about the research and the policy and the communications work. And this is broader than what we do programmatically. This goes all the way from early years, um, through schools, through apprenticeships, through FE, and onto university and access to the workplace. And the point of that work is to keep social mobility at the top of the agenda, but also to inform change, whether that's at a, a national policy level or whether it's in terms of what schools, universities, businesses are doing. Um, but we think that, you know, the magic happens um, and we'd like to do more of this when those two things come together. I mean, they're never going to perfectly overlap because they have slightly different aims, as I, as I said. Um, but we know that that programme work really gives our research great credibility. 
uh, because it has a, a real world edge and it's based in our experience of working with these young people. And we know that our research drives innovation in our programs and the data that's come out of the 40,000 or so young people we've worked with to date helps to drive innovation in our programs, refine and hone what those programs do and the sort of obstacles they seek to challenge. So it's a really good symbiotic relationship between those two halves of our work. And it's something that we want to grow much more, which is why the work on evaluation and impact is so important. And then just the last slide from, from me before I hand over uh, to Laura. Um, I mean, we've been at this for, for 23 years now. We were set up by Peter Lample, as many of you know, back in, in 1997. Um, and we were involved in this well before sort of social mobility became a, a common term in the sort of policy debate, in the education debate. Um, so we have this great hinterland, we have this great um, network to, to work with. And so every year, um, our programs are oversubscribed. We have about 15,000 applications for the 5,000 face-to-face -face places we have on our programs. Um, we work with um, many of the top universities in this country and abroad. And I think that's a really important point for this um, webinar is that when I talk about our impact, I'm actually talking about the impact we have jointly had in collaboration with the university partners we work with and with the other not-for-profit partners we work with because that's absolutely at the heart of our approach. Um, we've managed to influence government policy on a number of occasions in our history. We have a great base of donors and alumni and we're really proud to have worked with about half the state schools in this country. But there is much, much more we want to do and need to do, which is why we're not complacent. And these numbers, of course, just give you a sense of our, our, re our reach, our network, our scale. But what we're always really keen to do is actually to understand our, our genuine impact. And this goes all the way from when Peter founded us with his own money, knowing that his marginal pound was well spent. So the question we always ask ourselves is what would have happened to a Sutton Trust student if they weren't on one of the programmes we run? What, what would be their trajectory? And that's what the, the Data Hub tries to get at and some of the stuff that, that Laura will cover very shortly. But just to reiterate again, this is about the Sutton Trust impact, but it's really about the impact of our partnership with uh, businesses, universities, and other not-for-profits who are part of the, the collaboration that makes all this possible. Um, so with that, um, I'll come back at the end for a little bit of a forward look and to answer some questions, but I'll hand over to um, Laura to talk in a bit more detail about the, the evaluation work. Great, thank you very much, James. And I think that's a really um, important point um, that James has mentioned there around um, our partnerships and all the work that we do with many people that will be um, on the call with us here um, today. Um, and so what we're hoping to do today is to, to share the, the Impact Hub with our partners um, before we launch it fully on the website next week to give you a bit of a sneak peek at it and a chance to kind of digest it before we share it um, a bit more broadly. Um, so what um, we thought would be useful is just to, to recap on some things that some of you might be quite familiar with, but for others it might be um, fairly new information or a reminder of, of how we approach evaluation at the Trust. So we have been uh, set up and running programmes since 1997, um, and as James has mentioned, evaluation and data and insights have been core to everything we do all the way um, from those early days, um, collecting information on students that we work with, um, working with external evaluators to look at counterfactual evaluations for 10 plus years. So it's definitely something that's in our DNA, I suppose, at the Trust, but something that we're not complacent about. And we're always trying to look at new ways of evaluating our programmes. And as the landscape changes and more programmes become available for students to take part in, the policy landscape changes, it's important that we're continuing to look at the impact of our programmes. So as an, an overview and a summary, this is what we're trying to achieve with students who are on our programmes. Um, we're looking at um, some behaviour changes and some attitude changes um, throughout the different programmes that we run. So we're looking to try and change um, the way that students make decisions and making sure, as James mentioned earlier, that they're really informed, whichever route it is they choose to go down, whether that's universities, apprenticeships, um, as long as they have got all the information, there's not a barrier there for them to go to the destination that they want to go to. 
We're also looking to improve their skills. So um, whether that be how to write a personal statement, how to um, apply for an apprenticeship and have a job interview, whether it's networking skills or debating skills, if you're looking at certain careers, we want to make sure that students are well equipped to move forward with, with the progress that they want to make. And we hope those things combined, plus all of the other experiences they have on their programme, increase their confidence um, that whichever university, um, job or profession it is that they choose to go into, that they feel like they belong there. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest things actually for us to um, quantify. But often when we speak to our students, our alumni and our university partners, that confidence piece is a bit that's, that's really um, high up in terms of what we think um, impacts students. So we hope all of those changes in, in attitudes and, and kind of behaviours um, translate into increased applications and ultimately increased access into institutions or professions um, where they've typically had um, barriers um, for students to access. And obviously the ultimate goal beyond that is not just getting students into university or into an apprenticeship, but making sure they progress after that on into society and being able to um, live um, and work in a way that is more socially mobile than they might have done otherwise. So the way that we do that um, is looking at a number of different um, data sets and a number of different evaluation methodologies. So you can see here kind of at the bottom, um, at the, the base of, of the house, we call it, and um, we have um, our programs and we look at those in terms of um, working with our partners to work on evaluation reports, um, reports that come back a couple of times a year to understand how universities and other partners are experiencing the delivery of programmes and looking at student experiences through case studies as well to make sure we've got an understanding of how that's working on the ground. Um, we also look at the targeting of students. So we want to make sure that the students that we work with um, are really um, eligible for our programmes, both in terms of their um, social mobility background, but also the academic profile as well. Um, it's no use for us just expanding our programmes to lots and lots of young people if we don't retain that targeting and making sure we're reaching the students who need it most. And I'll explain a little bit more about that targeting later when we look at the impact hub itself. Um, those um, attitude changes that I mentioned, we look at evaluating those through surveys, so through baseline, midpoint and exit surveys to see how students progress through our programmes and they're all evaluated externally um, to the Sutton Trust. So it's really important for us that we have external evaluators looking at our work. So it's not just the Sutton Trust evaluating how we think we're doing, but we have that independent and objective view to help us really shape what we need to be doing differently and highlight what we might be doing well. And then finally, we also use um, a lot of the, the hard data, if you like, so looking at where students actually apply and where they go. And we use that data to, to see um, how they compare to, to similar groups of students like them. So that's called counterfactual evaluations um, and making sure that the programmes are having the impact that we desire. So the way that the Impact Hub um, fits into this is trying to pull out some of those different um, aspects and some of those different data sets um, and display it in a way that um, hopefully is user friendly, but is accessible and transparent as well. So we at the Trust have had access to this data for a long time and we, you know, we share it with um, our partners, we share it with um, donors and we share it with with people who, who we work with, but we wanted a way to make it a lot more accessible for people to understand the work that we're doing, which is why um, we've built um, the hub in this way. So the couple of data sets that sit behind it, um, so we're looking at the applications of students, so students that have applied and have taken part in our programmes, um, and that allows us to look at um, their eligibility criteria, so which of our criteria they're meeting, but also which areas of the country is it that they're coming from, and we'll speak a little bit later about how we're using that geographical data to, to kind of plan and think about the future. Um, we've then also um, got within the hub at the moment 10 years worth of tracking data so students from 2006 to 2016 who've been on a Sutton Trust programme looking at which universities it is that they've gone on to um, and what some of their um, outcomes are after that as well. Um, and we've then also got some independent evaluation that we've um, included as some headline stats and some case studies from students as well, because we think it's really important to balance the quantitative data with the qualitative um, as well. So that's what you're um, about to, to see and where all the different kind of data sets come from. 
So now I'm going to attempt to um, change my screen view so that you can see it. So just bear with me while I try and do this seamlessly. James, can you give me a nod if you can see that? You're the only person I can see. Perfect. Great, so this is um, the, the data hub and, and where you start. So as James has mentioned, this will be um, on our website um, from next week. So we're giving all of you a chance to kind of see it first and, and digest it and, and reflect on it before it goes live on that site. So you're able to work your way through to start off with some of the headline statistics um, of the trust um, and some of the evaluation work we've done over the past um, 20 years. So first of all, as I mentioned earlier, targeting is a really important piece for the trust. So you can look at some of the targeting stats. So here we can see that students on a Sutton Trust programme are twice as likely to come from a disadvantaged area than their classmates. And they're three times more likely to be eligible for free school meals. So we also hold data internally on um, the schools that students go to, whether they're first in their family to go to university and you'll be able to dig down into that a little bit more once we get onto the geographical view but there's just some headline stats um, to start us off. Then using that um, 10 years of tracking data study that I mentioned, we can look at some of the destinations that students have gone on to. So we can see that students um, in the last 10 years, 92% um, of them went on to higher education, um, which is higher than um, similar programmes that our evaluators um, have looked at as well. So we're really pleased um, with those results. We can see beyond that, within that 92%, 7% of students um, have gone on to Oxbridge and a further 62% have gone on to what we would classify as a leading university. And the way that we've defined that are Russell Group Universities, 1994 universities and partners within the Sutton Trust Consortium as well. So that's allowing us to see the types of universities that students are going on to. Um, and as James mentioned earlier, it's um, not, we don't definitely don't see it as a fair if students haven't gone to these universities it's great that they've made an informed choice um, and um, so we just want to make sure that we've reflected where they've gone but um, whichever de direction students have chosen to go on to it's better that those eight percent potentially have chosen not to go to university if they would have gone anyway and then chosen to, to drop out so um, you can see a bit about the destinations um, we then have um, some of our counterfactual studies um, that we've mentioned earlier. So we've um, included a couple of different statistics from a range of different studies that we've done all the way from kind of 2011 to, to more recently. Um, we've tried a lot of different methodologies. So you can see um, once you click into here, there's some icon boxes that you can click on, which will tell you a little bit more about the study that was done, the cohorts that were looked at and some of the controls that the um, evaluators put into place. Um, but we look here at the um, change in the um, students application rates to university. We've also done a study with UCAS, which looked at the offer rates of students who applied to universities. Um, how likely were they to receive an offer from a top university in comparison to similar students? And then we've also um, completed a study with the Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring um, at the University, at Durham University, looking at the enrolment rate of students um, at Russell Group Universities as well. So they're just a couple of different statistics um, that we've pulled out from a range of the different counterfactuals um, that we've completed over the years. Um, we can then look to see at that piece I mentioned earlier about it's not just about getting students into university or into um, an apprenticeship or into the, the first rung of their job, but making sure that we're looking a little bit longer term in terms of what actually happens to students in terms of their social mobility. Um, and this is a statistic that came through our work with the Higher Education Access Tracker, looking at the socioeconomic backgrounds of students. So it showed that 93% of students who are on the Sutton Trust program, when they joined the program, they were from the lowest socioeconomic group. So that's looking at their parents' um, jobs and their parents' kind of classifications of what they do. But after university and, and after graduation, 93% of those moved to the highest levels of socioeconomic groups. So we can see a real impact there from students enrolling at university, but then also um, moving on into careers and being successful after that, which is ultimately one of the, the biggest goals that we want to enable students to be able to, to progress after they get to university and not just have a kind of a bum on seat mentality once they get there. 
And finally, as James mentioned as well, we also work with um, a range of consultancies and we've worked with the Boston Consultancy Group for a number of years who look at um, the way that our investments work and the way that um, the amount of money that we put into programmes, what um, does that generate in terms of benefit for students? So we've been able to classify that for every pound that we spend on certain trust programmes, there's £14 worth of benefit for students in terms of their lifetime earnings. So we can see a real impact there. So you can scroll through those and just kind of have a look at some of those overall um, headline statistics to take you through a bit of the journey, I suppose. Um, but the next piece that you can do is also um, look at our data in a bit more detail. So this is when it gets a bit more granular. So you can click um, onto the explore our data and you'll see um, a map come up here um, that you are able to explore in a number of different ways. So I'll just talk you through a couple of the different views. And like I said, when we share this after today, you're welcome to have um, a bit more of a play around and, and look at some of the areas that you might be the most interested in. So on the very headline view, you can look at all of the Sutton Trust programmes and all of our UK universities. So you can see here where our different programmes take place across the UK. At the moment, we've only included the UK Summer Schools and the Pathways to Law programme alongside the US programme. Um, that's simply because of the data that we've had available that's come back through the heat tracking system. So as soon as we get more data back on our Pathways to Medicine and banking programmes, all of that will get added into this um, as well. But for now, these are the programmes that you can see. So you can look at a whole um, country view, the whole of the UK and see that um, over time, we've got 30,284 student um, records. So that's slightly lower as you, you would have seen from the start of the 38,000 that we've um, worked with overall. And um, that's just because of the student records that we've been able to keep on account um, based on changes to GDPR and all of those kind of data issues. Um, so you'll be able to see here where students go on to, so whether they've progressed to their host university, so if they've done a UK summer school with a certain university, did they go on to that university in particular? You can see where they've um, enrolled um, at another partner within the Sutton Trust Consortium for that um, programme specifically and the percentage that have gone on to a leading university. Now, all of the data down here, as you can see, is for the last 10 years. So just to make that clear that you've got the 30,000 students supported over all, all time, but the progression data that you can see here is the students in the last 10 years. So you can look at a very high level there. You can then also start to drill down if you want to, to look at the different programmes in particular. So you can see the summer schools and pathways to law as well. And you can also look at university view um, as well. So if we use Durham as an example here, you can click on the University of Durham and see the um, number of students that have been supported by that university over all time and those kind of destination figures that we talked about earlier um, for that university in particular. And then for each university and um, where we've got them, we've also included some case studies from students who've gone to that university um, and how they found that experience. So if you're interested in particular universities or particular areas of the country, you can have a look in that way. Um, the same works for the um, Pathways programmes as well. So if we chose a university like Manchester, for example, you can see um, smaller, smaller data sets within those. So some of the percentages are a lot more sensitive um, once you get down to smaller data sets, but you can see the progression rates there. Um, and for some of the universities, we've also got some video case studies. So again, I'm going to try and um, show you one of these and hope um, that it works. We did a practice earlier. And I'm Rahima, I'm on the Pathway to Law programme and I'm from Manchester. Neither of my parents work in law, so I've never really had any law influence or any experience. Whereas now, like, I'm on the Pathways to Law programme and I've had so many opportunities that I wouldn't have had before. So I've had work experiences, I've had networking events, meeting workshops, all of these have really helped me to decide that I want to pursue law. The Pathways to Law programme has definitely given me more confidence. I just feel more independent and that I have more, um, have more skills and that I definitely want to be a barrister when I'm older. So that's one example um, of a case study that you can look at. So you can go in and have a look at the different universities and explore some of our students' stories. Now I mentioned the US programme earlier. 
um, we have um, a separate kind of pop out view that works for the US program. So if you're interested in finding out more about that program, um, you can click on here and see the destinations of where our students have gone. Um, you'll see a lot of them over here um, on the East Coast, um, likely wanting to be as close as home to possible as possible to fly back and forth. And also California, because who wouldn't want to move to California if you're moving to the US and go to the nice sunshine um, area. So you can explore a little bit more about the US. And then the other piece that you can look at, as I mentioned earlier, is the targeting data. So um, you can look at this based on um, regional views. So um, again, at the moment, if you look here, you can see all wide of the UK. So these are the numbers of students that we were able to, to, to use in terms of their um, data on, on their eligibility and where they come from geographically. Um, and then you can see which of our criteria um, that they typically meet within a program. So the four social mobility criteria that we look at are whether students are eligible for free school meals, whether they're first generation. We look at their school that they go to, if it's a low performing school or if the school serves a disadvantaged community. And we also look at their home postcode as well. So you're able to see some of that, those demographics and also the criteria that the students have met. As a baseline, we try and um, aim for 80% of our students meeting three or more of our criteria. Obviously, measuring disadvantage um, is you need to take that in a very holistic view. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's a ballpark that we aim for. So with the average student meeting 3.6, we're kind of well above that, that target that we look at. So what you can do um, in this view, it's fairly self-explanatory is you can click on a region, um, it will show you um, the students that we've supported um, over time in that region and the makeup of that. You can then look again if you want to um, have a look at it based on programmes, if you're particularly interested in a specific programme, you can look to see um, where students have come from on the UK summer schools, for example. And then you can also drill down a bit more if you're interested in particular constituencies. So if you um, kind of look around these areas, um, you can see in Northwest Cambridgeshire, for example, we've supported 56 students on the UK summer school program, and these are their demographics. Um, and again, where possible, we'll have included um, some of these average criteria met and some case studies as well. So that's the summary um, of the um, impact hub. Um, like I said, we will share this with everybody so that you can um, digest it a little bit more, explore it a little bit more. Um, and we've got a week before it, it kind of goes out live. So if you have anything that you kind of pick up that you want to talk to us about, um, we are um, very open to hearing from you. Um, so just moving on from that, we thought it'd be useful. Um, obviously, it's a great tool for us to have and a way for um, partners and supporters to engage with the trust and understand our data in a bit more detail. But we are not just using the data hub as a kind of an external tool to, to demonstrate our data and, and have that transparency. We're also using the data to inform our programmatic approach and our strategic approach um, as well, which James will talk about in just a moment. So what we've been able to do through, um, through collecting this data on, on the data hub um, and analyzing it is, um, is understand the way that our programs work a bit, a bit better. So we now know that on, our, on average, one in 10 students on a Sutton Trust program enroll at their host institution, so the, the university that they do a program with. One in three enroll at a consortium partner for that program. So, for example, we have 13 universities on the UK summer school program. So one in three students would enroll at one of those 13 universities and seven out of 10 students enroll at a leading university. So we're able to see um, benefit for our partnerships work with universities, both in terms of students enrolling at their institution, but we're also seeing that students who have perhaps been on a programme at Bristol, for example, may go on to enroll at Warwick or vice versa. And we're able to kind of share with universities where across the consortium um, certain trust students are going and where they're gaining admissions from. And you can just see here some of the top universities um, that our, our students um, enroll at. And one of the things I suppose that was really encouraging for us to see, um, particularly with Nottingham, Cambridge, Oxford and Bristol, their partners that we've been working with for 20 plus years now. So the partnership model is really working in terms of the longer we've been working with universities and the more programmes we run with them, the more likely they are to have um, Sutton Trust students enrolling at them.
So that's been really a positive message, I suppose, for us and for the consortium and the way that we're working. Um, we've also been able to see the types of um, um, courses that students go on to study once they get to university. Um, a few here that are not surprising, um, law, medicine, um, are the, the programmes that we have the most demand for from students, but also a lot of the, the subjects that um, our universities run in terms of their summer school programmes um, and their different departments that, that feature quite prominently in the courses that we're, we're able to run. And so the way that we use this information is to really try and understand um, where our students want to go, the type of provision that we should be putting on in terms of our programmes to make sure that we're catering for those students, but also thinking about are there subjects and areas that our students are going into that potentially need a bit of extra support. So for example, with law and medicine, they're very competitive courses to get on, but they're also very competitive once you've graduated and you want to become a lawyer. So that's where our pathways programs come in, where we have um, subjects and subject areas that where students face additional barriers, um, we're able to, to provide a bit more support to support them into employment as well as just into university. Um, and the final piece um, that we thought would be useful to share today um, isn't too surprising for us, but um, was still useful to, to find out when we were analysing this data with um, the Boston Consultancy Group. It's just to show that students, um, when you look at the area that they live versus the area where the university is located for the programme, there's a very high trend of students applying to their most local university. And that um, is expected within our Pathways programmes. But here we can see the data for UK summer schools where, in theory, students can apply to anywhere in the UK and their travel and accommodation is paid for. So there's no financial barriers there for students to choose the university that's most local to them. But they still um, are doing that. And you can see that effect even more strongly once you um, remove Cambridge out of the UK summer school consortium that students are even more likely to apply to their local university. University. So that's really interesting for us to find out, but it's also really helpful for us when we think about our future work and our expansion. So, for example, when we've expanded recently in the UK summer school sphere, we've gone to the University of Cardiff and the University of Glasgow, which supports us to get into communities where students um, potentially weren't um, having any kind of um, university interaction from a certain trust basis um, previously to help us with that geographical reach. So that is some of the ways that we have used the data um, already, I suppose, to inform some of our programmatic responses. And James is just going to touch on now um, how we're using it to think even further forward for our next phase of the strategy. Great. Thank you, Laura. And actually, before I forget, I should thank Laura and her team and Hillary because they've been the driving force of collating all this data and presenting it back in the way you've just seen, which I think is a real step forward in terms of us understanding it, but also being able to communicate it. So a big thank you from me to them. Um, and the work genuinely has prompted us to think about what we do next and how we should uh, potentially grow the work of the trust, you know, particularly as we plan for the next five years strategy. So our current strategy comes to an end this year. So we're looking at what we do um, for, the, for the next few years. Um, so Laura, if you just go on to the, to the next slide. Sorry, it's not moving. You might just want to start talking and I'll try and okay, fix it. No um, so the slide you'll see shortly, um, I would caveat it with being um, it's work in progress. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, it's work in progress, but it's very much about our target group, who we are currently serving and who potentially is underserved and we might need to do more work with. Um, so when we think at the trust, and this is what we've been doing over the last couple of years, particularly when we when we conceive of the sort of Sutton Trust target population, we think in broad terms of the top 15 percent in terms of um, ability or potential from the bottom 40 percent of households. And that's a group of about 50,000 young people um, in every year group. And it's top 15% because it's not niche, it's not just about a few prodigies, it's about casting the net a bit wider to capture the most talented young people. And it's the bottom 40% because it's not just about those from the most disadvantaged home, although of course we want to help them, but we know from the evidence that those just above, for example, the free school meal cutoff, 
also face inequalities, also do not have a good educational lot in life. So that's why we, we, we think of the, the, the cohort in those terms. Um, and what we've seen from this analysis, and this is analysis coming out of the data hub, coming out of work that the Boston Consulting Group did with us over the summer, which Laura mentioned, is that our programs are pretty good at reaching you know, the most disadvantaged and the very bright. And they're in the, they're in the top right hand corner of this diagram, the sort of light, light blue box. So our pathways, our summer school programs, which are about switching on these bright low income kids um, to potentially another university uh, choice for them. Um, and there's more we can do there. You know, we want to, to, to deepen what we do there. There's room for some expansion. You know, we can work with this group pre-16, support them while they're at university. There's plenty to do with that group. But ultimately, expansion there is, is relatively limited for us because our analysis suggests that we're already reaching about two thirds of that group, that group who are in the academic ballpark to get into those universities, but who aren't. Um, and of course, the other third may well be supported by universities independently or by lots of the other great organisations working in the space. So more we can do there, but, but limited. Um, but then if you look at this, this other part of the 50,000 population, there are young people who are equally disadvantaged, so from the poorest backgrounds, but who are getting that level of attainment just down from our sort of Russell Group eligible students. And this is the, the grey box on the, on the chart. Um, and these are young people who probably aren't going to get into those leading universities, even with um, very ambitious contextual admissions, but they are disadvantaged. They're still in that top 15%. So they still have huge potential. And so we can think about how we can cater for them in terms of other career options, um, great apprenticeship routes, other higher education routes. So that's a group that we're very interested in. And then the other group, I think, which is the, the lemon yellow, the remainder of that box, the remainder of the 50,000. I mean, many of those are you know, very bright, um, but they're perhaps not the most disadvantaged. So we don't want to devote really intensive resources to them, but they're still below, they're still in that bottom 40% group. They still don't have as great chances in life as the other 50% or the top 10% or whatever it might be. So they do need some support. And is there a way that we can get at many of those in large scale numbers in a lighter touch way? And that's where the work we've been doing with Sutton Trust online comes in because we can potentially offer that to a, a, a greater number of, of students than we could ever reach through face to face contact. So I guess as we think about our next five year strategy, think of what comes next. The crux is how we serve this 50,000 group. You know, what can we do with the group we're currently working at and doing, doing so well with? Um, but equally, um, how can we um, uh, help the 93% who currently don't have a Sutton Trust experience? Is it appropriate for us to help them? Are others helping them? And if, and if not, what sort of programs could we um, introduce? Um, so the last slide for me, Laura, if you just go, go on to it, picks up some of the things that we are thinking about in terms of our strategy. And I'm sure it will change um, at any moment. Yeah, it seems this, to be a slight delay, but it's coming. Don't worry. So the first bullet I can tell you will be um, we're going to continue to develop and update the data hub. So this is our first shy at the data hub. It's the first time we've presented the work in this way. Inevitably, there's going to be some things we want to improve. As Laura mentioned, there's new data already that we want to go in, get in there. So it's as good as it can be. Um, so that will be something that we update and refine over, uh, over the next period. Um, a big part for us on the evaluation side now, of course, is evaluating the relative merits of digital versus face-to-face -face delivery. So this year, of course, for the first time, like lots of other organisations, we had our first solely online provision for, for 7,000 young people. We want to compare their outcomes and their experience with our previous face-to-face -face programmes. And we're doing that through the heat data, we're doing that through um, independent evaluation through the bridge group. But ultimately, as we get more into steady state, I think it's a really interesting question for us to look at Let's compare online only versus face-to-face -face only versus a hybrid approach, because that will help us to refine the program and make it as cost effective as possible. And again, it might be certain groups need more inter intensive intervention and certain groups need lighter touch intervention. 
The third thing on our list is, you know, our next control group study. So we're really proud over 10 years to have commissioned three substantive independent evaluations using a control group, using a counterfactual group, but they use different methodologies. They span a decade of time. The last one was, um, the last substantive one was a few years ago now. So we want to um, commission a new um, counterfactual evaluation to really understand the latest in terms of what do Sutton Trust students do, which they otherwise wouldn't have done if it wasn't for our intervention. And we're working with the Institute of Employment Studies uh, potentially to commission that shortly. Um, and then the last bit, and then I will stop, um, is about this key issue of understanding our target demographic better. So there's 50,000 students, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 of them we're catering for really well. What about the others? What is it appropriate for us to do? We think there's a lot of underserved students in that area who aren't getting support, but we need to test that uh, hypothesis. We need to segment that population into different sorts of groups, different sorts of peoples, because they will face different challenges. And then we need to think about what is appropriate for us to do as an organization to help overcome the, those challenges, working as always with, with our partners. Um, so there's a lot of work for us to do over the next six months, a year, as we, as we go forward. Um, it is ambitious. There are some sort of thorny issues that we need to um, look at, of course, in, in terms of impact that always is with these things. Um, but, but genuinely, at the heart of it all, is a desire to be driven by an analysis of the needs of these young people and to be driven by, you know, as, as, as good an understanding as we can possibly get of what works and, and what makes a difference. Um, so thank you for listening to us for, um, I guess, nigh on um, 50, 50 minutes. Um, but we have got um, 10 minutes at the end, um, which we'd be delighted to take some questions or if you have any points, um, it would be great to hear them. Um, but we're following up the conversation afterwards um, with many of you, I know, um, and we'd be keen to, to carry on the conversation offline as well. Um, but if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll try to, to answer them. Um, Hilary, I think you're going to fire the questions at me and Laura so that we can um, start to answer a few of them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we've got um, we've got one question to start with. Um, so how are you thinking more broadly about tracking student success as well as the progression data in the impact hub? So thinking a bit more kind of long term about where certain trust students are in five and then 10 years time. Uh, Laura, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. That sounds good. Um, so um, as part of the, the data that we collect, we're able to, to see some, as many institutions will, who are using the Higher Education Access Tracker, we're able to see some initial um, data around where students have gone on to in terms of employment six months after university using the Delhi surveys. Um, and the types of jobs that they've gone into. So there's a bit of administrative data that we can um, click into there and, and get some information on. Um, but also through our um, alumni network, which is um, ever growing, and making sure we're keeping in touch with our alums to understand where they're going and their journeys, whether that's through um, surveys or case studies or conversations with our alumni leadership board. So there's a couple of different routes um, that we'll be using. Um, tracking students into employment is more challenging than tracking them into university. So um, it is an area that we'll, we'll kind of continue to focus on. But at the moment, they're the two routes that we've got, some of the administrative data, um, but also um, some of the more qualitative data through our alumni networks. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, next one, Hilary. Um, so the next question um, I think must relate to the stat you showed, Laura, about the 93% moving from the lowest to the highest groups. So um, how, how have we tracked socioeconomic status after gradu graduation? So how did we do this and for how many students? So that was tracked again through the Higher Education Access Tracker was part of the analysis that they provided for us. So they look um, at the NSSEC data, I believe, which looks at the level of profession. Um, so before students go to university, it's looking at the parental um, the parental history of um, their job occupation and it classifies their jobs 
on the NSEC um, criteria and then it's looking at students post graduation and um, the types of jobs that they've gone into so it is a subset of the, um, the data that we've presented today so from the it's still looking at that 2006 to 2016 cohort but not all of them will have graduated from that cohort at the time of the data set um, and they don't necessarily have all of the administrative data on those students so it is a smaller subset but it is still quite substantial as we had about 15 to 20 thousand records that went through that. Thank you Laura and um, Hilary we've probably got time for, for one or two more because I think we said we'd finish just before half past. Um, yeah so another question um, I guess relating to the fact that the trust has been doing these sorts of evaluations for a while has evaluation got easier or harder over time I guess as kind of more data is now available for students? Um, yeah, I'll have, a, I'll have a crack at this one because I was around when the 2011 evaluation um, was undertaken. So um, I've seen it over time. Um, I, I guess it's a bit, I, I think it's a bit of a, a plus and minuses. I think it has got easier in that we have a lot more data. So we have a much bigger sample to draw on and therefore I think our conclusions can be more robust. I think the bar in terms of the expectations on organisations in terms of evaluation has increased as well, which I think has driven up uh, standards and there's a lot more expertise in the sector and in academia on how you evaluate these sorts of programs so I think that is all positive. I think one of the troubles we've had and I'm sure lots of other organizations have as well is that when we did some of our most robust studies back in 2010-2011 we could get individual match data so the, the 2011 study that um, Laura mentioned was um, an individual on a Sutton Trust programme matched to an individual UCAS record, whereas now we are using more aggregate level data because GDPR and other things doesn't allow us to do that individual stuff. Um, so I think, I think the bar is generally higher, but the methodological challenges probably because of that data access issue have got um, potentially harder. I don't know, Laura, you've been leading it more, more recently than me though, so I don't know if you've got any reflections. No, I agree on that. I think it's, you know, some pluses and, and some minuses. And I suppose the other challenge for us is um, you know, as we extend the evaluation, like I mentioned earlier, to look at student success beyond just getting into university. And also as we're launching our apprenticeship stream of work, there's not um, a UCAS equivalent or a HESA or a HEAT equivalent for students going into apprenticeship. So it's also... Um, you know, there's, there's some areas where the data is um, less available um, than it is for, for traditional kind of university programme routes. So some pluses and some minuses, I would agree. Great, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time, but um, we will be in touch um, with everybody um, after this who's interested, particularly our, our university partners, to share the hub in its sort of dummy form so you can have a good look around at it and we're really keen um, for feedback but if you've got any uh, burning questions or anything you want to ask us offline please do email us you may well have our email addresses but if not just email the events at Sutton Trust email address where the invitation come, came from and we'll make sure we um, answer them all um, but just you know just a big thank you uh, to me uh, from all from me sorry to all of you um, for tuning in to this webinar at this lunchtime. Um, as I said at the beginning, everything we do is in partnership with people. So this is a reflection on all the great work that many people joining this call have done. And it's a partnership, it's partnerships that we're extremely grateful for and proud of. Um, so yeah, look forward to engaging with you more on this. Um, but thank you for, for listening and um, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, um, but have, have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>